Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him, that is Jesus, to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Well, do read on later on because we have then, as you can see, the burial of the Lord Jesus. And on Sunday, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 24, the first section and the second section, where we read about Jesus rising from the dead. But we'll have to wait till Easter Sunday for that. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you um, Professor Ian White. Let's give him a warm welcome, shall we? So welcome. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Indeed. Now we we've repeatedly advertised you as a senior academic. Is this referring to your age or? Yes, I, I thought that was probably the most <laughs> likely reason. Yes, it's. Uh, I am aware that I'm greying rapidly. And, uh, uh, All right, you're you professor of what? Uh, I'm officially a professor of engineering, but I specialise more in electronic and electrical engineering. Okay, and do we need electronic engineering? Is this sort of crystal radios type thing? Well, crystal radios, of course, were very successful and lasted a very long time. But uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, the average mobile phone would be rather large if we were still using them. Um, <laughs> so we would All right. need quite, quite many of them. But uh, yes, hopefully uh, a lot of good comes out of electronic engineering. All right, what sort of good? Uh, well, well, I'm sure we'd enjoy holding this meeting in candlelight, uh, for right. example. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, 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 seriously, obviously, the range of applications and the uh, over my lifetime, uh, the way in which the field has evolved has been considerable. I've got a colleague um, uh, in the engineering department uh, currently who's calculated that. 80% uh, of the papers, and arguably, therefore, 80% of the knowledge in electrical engineering uh, have been written in our lifetime. Uh, so uh, it's a field that's evolved really quite rapidly, and the advances have been quite dramatic. My own field is linked to communications, and uh, as, as you said, you called me senior. Um, over my lifetime, roughly speaking, the speed of the communication systems that we would use has grown about 10 million times. 10 since million I, times. Since, since I was So working. whatever so you learned as an <laughs> undergraduate is now, what, obsolete? Uh, well, I didn't learn very much, so there wasn't, <laughs> I, well, there, there, there wasn't a great issue. But no, I, I think, uh, obviously, uh, the uh, and of course this could be true of a lot of fields, the fundamental principles 
remain very firm. And a lot of, uh, if, as is true of many other fields of study, uh, the fundamental principles of electronics, the way in which you base a lot of the new advances, those physical principles don't change. And therefore, that aspect that you've learned, but obviously, many of the uh, details that we learned when we were students have now been surpassed considerably. Yes. So if there's been this rapid increase of knowledge about electro electronic engineering, is this growing exponentially, you know, in the next 20, 30 years, is there going to be much more? There are, there are a range of obvious challenges and opportunities in electronic engineering, as is true, of course, of many other forms of engineering and in many other disciplines across the sciences and no doubt elsewhere. Um, so uh, one is very optimistic that a lot more will be learnt in the coming years and will be used to good. Yes, I would feel well, that very it's strongly. It's interesting you said that phrase, used to good, because I was going to ask you, does that leave you a little apprehensive because human beings have the capacity to take what is good and use it for our own harm? Does it worry you as to where all this knowledge, this information might lead? No, I, I, I think if uh, one studies... Uh, the advances in recent years, although obviously there have been numerous instances where things have gone very sadly wrong. Nonetheless, overall, I think uh, the well-being that we have has been due to uh, engineering scientific advances been very positive indeed. Uh, you know, if you go back and look at disease prevention or quality of life in, in you know, centuries gone by, uh, matters were really rather different and one has great hope that the, the, the good will outweigh any potential disadvantages. But you raise an important point because I think in engineering there needs to be a constant desire to make sure that any other humanitarian or ethical issues are considered at any time, as is of course the case in mm. bi uh, biological and medical sciences. Now, we've, you're a professor, but we, we, we know, I think, that you have you know, other responsibilities um, with regard to a college. Are you, are you still doing research, personally doing research? Uh, I still, I still uh, engage in research. As for, Do you? Um, absolutely. I've still got a research group. Obviously, um, there are other calls in my time, so I'm not devoting myself to it um, uh, as, as much as some so of what, my colleagues in the university. So what are you researching at the moment? <clears throat> Uh, my own uh, activity is primarily concerned with the continuing need uh, for greater communications uh, uh, for various applications, primarily the internet. Um, uh, there's a growing need uh, for uh, greater in, uh, capacity in systems so that, for example, video information, ever higher qualities of pictures, movies, um, and then a whole range of uh, medical applications can be operated across the internet. And, uh, and, and there are considerable engineering opportunities and challenges. We're aware currently that the combination of medical and, and, and media applications alone are likely to require about 10,000 times the bandwidth of the current internet. Um, but in, uh, that has challenges. There are some quite substantial limits that are about 10 to 100 times away that have to be overcome in some way. And uh, in addition, um, in some countries, uh, the carbon emissions due to information technology now exceeds uh, the carbon emissions due to air travel and as a rough rule of thumb if the bandwidth of your internet goes up by 10 times in conventional cases the uh, energy consumption goes up 10 times and mm. therefore the emissions are likely to go so obviously 10,000 times the current carbon emissions is not something that one wow. would wish to contemplate so there are challenges and there's the, there's quite a lot and of you're researching into this that's uh, your... we are contributing to that in you're some contrib way all right um let me go back because clearly this isn't a cambridgeshire accent is it where where did you you grow up? Oh, I'm surprised. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I still struggle uh, <laughs> to communicate. No, no, we're, we're following uh, you. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, I grew up originally in the north of Ireland, um, uh, just in a town just north of Belfast. Okay. Um, now, t sorry to go back to the age thing, but looking at um, your brow, your furrowed brow, um, I suspect you were in Northern Ireland at a time when there were trouble, the troubles were were happening? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, they started when I was about eight. Yes. Okay, so do you remember them starting? 
Uh, just about, yes. yes. I don't did, remember much before. Did your yes. parents talk to you about what was happening? Um, I, I, was, I was very fortunate. I came from a, a very loving uh, family, and uh, they, they did talk about it, but uh, they were very clear uh, to, um, I, I feel, give a very helpful advice uh, about the troubles. And uh, we were, I was very fortunate in the way in which I grew up in an environment where um, we were able to know, um, I happened to be a Protestant, and know Roman Catholics, and, right. and, and that actually uh, was something I was very grateful for indeed, actually yeah. the school the secondary school I went to by the time Look, I finished. I'll come back to the that. Troubles, but just to pick up on what you said about your family, it was a loving family. Was it a Christian family? Yes, yes, it was my, my so, parents. So you, would, you went together as a family to church? Yes, that's right, very much so. Did you resent it or enjoy it? Uh, um, uh, uh, no, I, I, I think it, it, it's fair to say, actually, that uh, I had a very loving sister as well, which I didn't often say when I was a teenager. <laughs> and uh, actually, no, I, I don't, we didn't resent going to church. Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's sometimes said that in, in many churches, there's a very strong sense of love and belonging. And although the church I attended was very clear that anybody coming in should take their own view about faith, uh, they went out of their way to treat you as part of the family and I think all of us were made to feel like that um, mm. uh, from an early age. But having Christian parents and go, even going to church Ian doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. Do you remember how it was you came to Christian faith? Yes, I, I, I would say I, there were a number of stages. Uh, it, it was a slightly unusual situation for me because I don't really ever remember a time in my life when I questioned in a negative way whether Jesus was the Son of God or questioned the truth in the Bible. I, I grew up accepting it, and as I increasingly um, considered it and looked, studied into it, it seemed to me the uh, evidence that Jesus had come to this earth, had lived as a man, had said what he said in the Bible, um, had been persecuted in the way he was, had, uh, had suffered, had died and rose again. That always seemed to me to be the, the truth. Mm. What happened was, however, that uh, in the summers, um, we would uh, go quite often as a family and attend events uh, at, at the seaside, uh, uh, beach mission uh, mm. events. Uh, and... Uh, over a number of years, uh, we got involved in these. Indeed, actually, um, they were very formative. Uh, uh, quite at an early age, uh, I, the Beach Mission would send me a little Bible uh, study notes to be read every day. And uh, the person that did that made a point of writing in a very personal way mm. to me every time these notes were sent uh, every few months. And, and that was quite an unusual and different relationship and gave me the opportunity to think things through so in the uh, when I had just become a teenager um, at one of these events due to um, a very dynamic young teacher actually explaining how he'd come to faith um, I really realized uh, for the first time that in my view for me um, Christian faith couldn't be a passive activity you know if if Jesus had been the Son of God, mm. and if he had died uh, for me so that my sins could be forgiven and I could have new life, then I couldn't really, in all honesty, for me, just treat that as an intellectual curiosity. Mm. Um, I had either to decide to walk away or I had to decide to commit, to repent, um, to trust, believe, and obey. And uh, that was really quite a major turning point to me. It was a. It, it seemed to me that that if that had been done for me, I had to respond. Mm. Um, and and so that was really quite a major step in my faith. Mm. And you obviously did well at school, but if you were at school when the troubles were happening. Um, and actually, those early years were particularly bad years. Uh, how, how, how did they impact you? 
Well, I was very f f fortunate. Uh, I, I, I went to a, a wonderful school with very committed uh, teachers and, and actually a very special head teacher. And so, although it was in an area where uh, one was acutely aware of the violence of the Troubles, um, uh, by and large, my immediate friends um, uh, were very supportive, and uh, the school itself um, gave a, a very sen special sense of place um, in that environment with things changing dramatically around uh, to feel the one that could learn and uh, learn and grow. Um, and indeed, actually, it, it became a very important part of my Did faith. you ever meet anybody or know anybody who was caught up, affected? Uh, I don't know, I don't like to use the word, but killed in the troubles? It, we... We, we were quite fortunate. We, we had um, f uh, f friends, close friends, who were, were caught up, and indeed, uh, not many, but a few in my school were involved. Um, but, uh, and of course, uh, but, but I personally was not, mm. um, uh, and my immediate family were not. Okay. Um, uh, and we were obviously very thankful for that, very concerned, obviously, mm. um, at the time. Uh, uh, it, there was a huge desire for peace, mm. a huge desire to uh, see uh, how this situation could be healed and mm. changed. Um, and also a lot of misunderstanding about where, what was really causing it. And that inevitably affected you growing up. Yes. Now, you came to Cambridge University to study. Um, do you remember receiving a letter of acceptance? Uh, yeah, yes. Well, it didn't come by email in those days, did it? No, no, it, it did. It, it did, yes. I, I do. Uh, it was, it was uh, yes, it was very unusual because did I... Did you cartwheel around the room is what I'm really... You, you were overjoyed. I, I was. Uh, I, I was very humbled and very touched. Uh, it was, I have to say, it, it was a mixture of excitement, but also... Uh, some uh, apprehension because uh, uh, I was the first person in my immediate family to leave Northern Ireland to go to England and uh, of course uh, uh, you have snakes here uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> there are some we, in this church <laughs> but we'll leave that <laughs> uh, uh, though I've never seen one of course uh, but, um, but, but no being serious I, I, it was a major uh, change really yes and, I'm sure it was. So, you were here for how many years? All in, 13. Th did you, what, you kept failing and had to repeat? That's right. No, yeah, so I, I try, I'm somewhat concerned because someone taught me, who taught me is here tonight, oh, really? so <laughs> I need to be careful. And, um, and, and, and Christian-wise, Ian, how, how were those 13 years here at Cambridge? Because there is a lot of cynicism, you know, and scepticism about Christianity, as well as many other... Uh, Christians, but in the academic world, you're suddenly going to be confronted with people who are not making the assumptions that you make, etc. How did you cope? How, how, how did it affect you as a Christian? Well, in that respect, uh, I actually find Cambridge to be the most wonderful place uh, to um, grow in my faith as a Christian. I'd, it may be worth just going back to my school experience at some point because. Um, at that point, uh, when I was at the school, I was fortunate to see a huge growth in the Christian Union at the right. school um, uh, due to various reasons. Uh, the Christian Union had started daily prayer meetings and uh, uh, for special reasons. Um, and this taught me a lot about the nature of prayer and the fact that God would actually li li listen to prayers. You and saw answer prayer them. answered. Yes. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, th that had, had, had been a huge um, uh, encouragement to me in my faith and mm. really encouraged me to develop. Um, uh, and coming to, Chris, uh, to Cambridge uh, really was a very special opportunity to, to grow and to develop in that. There, uh, we got very heavily involved in the... Christian Union, um, uh, the, uh, where really there was uh, a remarkable uh, sense of 
um, uh, close fellowship, which I appreciated hugely, people coming from very different backgrounds, but having this huge bond and desire to serve the Lord. Um, and secondly, a very special opportunity to hear Bible preaching in a way I hadn't, uh, people um, from many different walks of life coming to do that. And in the university itself, although obviously, um, uh, and particularly when I was an undergraduate, there were some um, members of the university who were very outspoken in their views against Christianity. Um, nonetheless, uh, there were many eminent members of the university who were very positive and supportive. I remember I happened to be a student at Jesus College, and uh, the master at that time, a chap called Sir Alan Cottrell, who um, many regard as being the leading metallurgist, really, of the 20th century, and mm. really... Um, developed new aspects for that field and brought in a much greater sense of quantitative methods. I always remember at a, a, a meeting he w attended, him starting off having been asked, well, is there a God saying, well, we're here and someone obviously must have put us here. And, and seeing someone at that level uh, of um, intellect and inquiry uh, on the science side um, uh, being so clear on his faith made a deep impression on me. So, so overall, I was very encouraged and uh, was very fortunate to get involved in a range of activities. So you, you're an academic, but you don't think you're committing intellectual suicide to be a Christian? Because certainly, say, if you read Dawkins, The God Delusion, he has the most derogatory things to say about Christians, basically saying it's impossible to be a thinker, a scientist, an engineer, etc., and believe in God. Now, clearly you're thinking differently. Why? How, how, how do you approach that, that question of intellectual suicide? I, like, obviously, one studies these questions from a whole range of different approaches. But if you'll forgive me, possibly one way of starting to answer this question is, particularly on a day like today, which is Good Friday, mm. Is, is to go back to the, the first answer I gave, which was that if you take a view of who Jesus was, and if you do believe that he said he would die and rise again, and he did, and all the other things give you the confidence that he is God, hmm. then that is a very good basis to start from looking at these other principles. And I think actually in academic life, there is a... Uh, uh, there, there is a difference, I think, if you're a, a Christian, um, in that if you believe in a, th in a principle that there is absolute truth, and ultimately, of course, that is God, then actually your activities in research and in scholarship, in intellectual analysis, are about discovering more about God and about how he has worked in this world and elsewhere. And I've never struggled with that as a principle to mm. my life. Uh, it seems to me, yes, you can go and uh, uh, decide that uh, everything must start with you and you must discover on that basis. But it's never something that struck me. I, I remember being told a rather negative joke here, and I apologize because I know some colleagues from the university are here, and they may be theoreticians, but I remember once someone telling a joke about the difference between an experimentalist and a theoretician, And that was that if um, both were walking home at night one night and dropped their keys, the experimentalist would get down on their knees and you know, shuffle around to find the keys. The theoretician would go to the nearest street light because that's where he or she can see um, and work through. And I think actually there are two different approaches there. And uh, one, both will get to the keys, but actually um, I think starting with uh, the Christian faith for me has been the basis of really um, my approach to understanding the world in its general sense as it is. Um, it, it does affect you as an academic, obviously, in yes. different ways, in that, obviously, uh, what you study and what you learn is hopefully drawing you closer to God, which is a very positive experience for me. But also, it means that all credit of that, of course, goes back to God, as, mm. and which is how it should be. Mm. Um, but I, I recognize that uh, 
that if you don't have that set of values, then obviously um, you will want to, in your own minds, be able to justify everything on your basis. There must be colleagues, though, who are quite surprised that you are, quote-unquote, again, a senior academic, and yet you still have this um, very basic Christian belief that has so affected your life. Well, I, they may be because I'm old and uh, getting past it, but I, I think being serious, like, uh, you know, there are a, a very large number of, uh, I think, marvellous academics in this university and other universities in the UK and elsewhere who actually I learned from in my Christian faith. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly if you look at indeed actually some of the, the centers in Cambridge, like the Faraday Center, um, which studies uh, issues related to Christianity and science and other aspects in a very rigorous detail. Uh, again, Cambridge has been a place where yes, there are those that will question, but there are very eminent people who would uh, hold uh, views that align with mine of faith but have extremely rigorous intellectual analysis mm. to, to back those up, and I would commend those to you. Uh, are you a better scientist, engineer, because you're a Christian, do you think? Uh, no. You don't? Uh, I, I, no, no, that's a fair I, enough I, answer. I, I think, um, I, I, you know, I, I think one, you know, it, if, if you're an academic and you're being expected to discover things. I've no doubt that people can make more uh, extraordinary discoveries you know, by just um, uh, following their own subjects, irrespective right. of their beliefs. And, and I think I would res respect that hugely. Yes. I also, um, but I do feel uh, that, um, I, I do feel that it is, uh, very encouraging to many Christians in the field of academic research and scholarship when time and time again discoveries happen and time and time again that goes, seeks to underpin their faith. And certainly that has been my experience mm. time, and, uh, time and time again. Now, I think, Ian, it was when you were an undergraduate, or that sort of time anyway, when girls were first allowed to become students at Jesus College. Is that, is that more or less true? Uh, yes, that, that is and, correct. And um, what was your reaction to that? Were you, were you, um, did you throw your mortarboard in the River Cam? Uh, well, I, unfortunately, I didn't have one. But um, <laughs> uh, no, we, uh, 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 the college was uh, rightly delighted. Uh, and uh, but, but, on a uh, personal but basis... You? Were you delighted? Uh, yes, uh, it, it should, for those of you who are not aware, my wife was in the first year of Women at Jesus College <laughs> and is sitting in a far corner, so there is an agenda here with these questions, I think. Uh, but uh, no, it, uh, uh, it, uh, it is actually remarkable to see the social transformation in Cambridge that's happened uh, in the last 30 to 40 years with the, um, with women undergraduates being accepted by far more colleges and did when I was first a student, um, no, it and was, it has it enriched your, the university hugely. Yeah, no, it was your romantic life I was really delving into there. That's it? right. Um, <laughs> Ian, do you still pray? Uh, yes, uh, you, I do so pray very much. You prayed when you were at school, you said, and you learned a lot about prayer, but here you are all these years later, you still pray. Uh, prayer is, for me, uh, a truly wonderful gift. Uh, to be able to commune with God, uh, particularly a God that loves one in the way that uh, he does, having sent Jesus to die and rise again, uh, is truly remarkable. And uh, prayer obviously is something that in my life I've have seen answered in many ways for others. But the process of being able to pray enriches one oneself. Yeah. And uh, one always learns so much by doing it. And will, in my view, receives a lot of blessing through that, particularly praying for others. Um, and 
I think is a very special thing which I would commend to anybody. Hmm. Um, can I just ask you about the Bible as well? Um, do, you, do you read the Bible? Because it's been hugely attacked, hasn't it, in recent years. And especially in centres of learning, there's been so much criticism of the Bible. In fact, in some places, almost an extreme position that certain parts of the Bible are just wrong. You know, they, we don't want to be following them. Do you read the Bible? Do you take, how do you see the Bible? Uh, I do read the Bible. Uh, I very strongly believe that, again, uh, it is a privilege to have one and to be able to do so because uh, what it shows about God, particularly uh, the life of Christ, um, is so important and forms the principles of which um, apply every bit as much now as they certainly did when I was uh, young and um, obviously have applied to many for centuries mm. and millennia before that. Mm. Um, and it is obviously, uh, as times change and cultures change and communities change, time and time again, there will always be those asking, well, have we not moved on and should we not re-examine the truths of the Bible in the light of what we now know? And I think that's a good thing to do. I think, mm. it's, I, I think it's right to keep asking because that often allows one to draw out more insights from the Bible rather than less. Mm. But I can't in any way say that my a view of the integrity of the Bible or the truth that comes from the Bible has changed one iota since I was young. Yeah. Um, I, I can understand how some of the language at times resonates in different way with different people and indeed actually, um, uh, you know, uh, that is uh, something at times we should never take for granted that just because we happen to read something some way we have a, a, a clear understanding of it. But uh, the study and the application of the Bible to me are crucial for faith and uh, have been transformative for my life in many situations and I know for, my, uh, for the lives of many others probably would be far more st uh, stories of, from others present tonight about just how it's changed their lives. Hmm. Um, again, Ian, you've referred to the Lord Jesus several times. You've talked about his death and his resurrection. It is Good Friday. Um, Christians across the world will be thinking particularly about Jesus' crucifixion. What, what, does, what does the death of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, um, what does it mean to you? The crucifixion of uh, Christ... Um, really is at the absolute heart of my faith, or the cross sometimes is the other way of describing it. Um, to feel that um, a God not only was prepared to create us, but also to love us so much that he would wipe clean what we have done wrong and indeed continue to do so. Um, and allow us to have a relationship with him by virtue of Jesus dying for us and taking on himself um, the sins that we should be accounting for seems to me to be the most wonderful news that one could ever have. Um, to feel that one can take what one has done wrong, and to feel that I can have my sins not just forgiven but forgotten, uh, so that I actually can have a relationship with God, is something that uh, is just life changing. Hmm. Um, if you could have a eureka moment in your research in the future, what would it be about? That's the first time anybody has asked me that. <laughs> I only thought of it a second ago. <laughs> like one's always tempted to, say, one's always tempted to say world peace or or something like that. Um, I think uh, 
My feel, if, if one's trying to be pragmatic, uh, my own field over my lifetime has been about communications. Um, and the impact that that has made in society has been extraordinary. Mm. Um, uh, uh, like when I uh, was a, a student, I think um, less than way less than 50% of the world's population had access to a phone. Hmm. Um, whereas nowadays everybody assumes they've got that. And, uh, you know, I think in a country like India, for example, when I was a student, had half a million phones for a billion people. Um, and the impact that that communications has had has been tr truly um, uh, transformative for those cultures and communities, also in terms of sharing the gospel, to say the least. Um, and I think one, one has a feeling that if the next generation of breakthroughs could happen, so that everybody around the world could have access to the um, uh, uh, quality um, and level of support that some people have in the best part of the world, within my own specific research um, world, that would be very exciting and a huge change. I have to say, however, to be honest, at the end of the day, I do regard myself as a Christian who happens to be an academic rather than an academic who happens to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And um, I think eureka moments would really be associated with God being glorified. And um, uh, uh, people around the world turning to him, um, and uh, I think that goes beyond well beyond my research. <laughs> it probably does, but that was a good answer. Well done. Um, I, people are going to be very frustrated, but time has gone. In fact, I've gone over really. But you will stay around afterwards if people want to chat. And um, are you open to bribes for better degrees or not really? <laughs> 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 there are other people present tonight here. Much more, Let's show no, our no bribes. <laughs> oh uh, Thank you very much. Well, I was most nervous about that interview this week, I have to say, but wasn't that a delight? Thank you very much. Very much. That was fascinating. And please do stay around and talk to, um, to Ian afterwards. Um, I'm very conscious that it is Good Friday and conscious of the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, the world over Christians are thinking particularly about the, the death, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want, as it were, to be slightly different in my tone tonight um, and, and really, you know, take our minds back those 2,000 years to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want us to think a little bit about his death. Um, so here is this one who has lived an absolutely impeccable life. His enemies could find no fault in him. So Judas Iscariot, who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he didn't even have 30 days in which to spend it, but he went out and committed suicide, crying, I have betrayed innocent blood. Uh, Pontius Pilate, who was to send Jesus to the cross, uh, interrogated Jesus and, and could find no fault in him. In fact, he turned to the crowds who are all howling for his blood and he said, why? What evil has he done? I find no fault in him. And as we read earlier, the Roman soldier said, surely this man was the son of God. And yet he was, he was the one who supervised, who oversaw the crucifixion of Jesus. His closest friends testified in a very similar way. So John, who was very, very close to Jesus, said, in him is no sin. Uh, Peter, a sort of action man, said he did no sin. The book of Hebrews says he's without sin. Paul, the great intellectual, said he knew no sin. He was the sinless son of God who went around doing good. I often think I just go around, but Jesus went around doing good. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, he calmed the storm, he fed the hungry. He was absolutely spotless in his life and he demonstrated that he is who he claimed to be by these works of power. And yet, he allowed himself to be taken. They stripped from his, his, his back, his garments, and they lacerated his back. 
We often think in terms of the 39 lashings. It never says that about Jesus. It was an unlimited beating on a bare back. And then on that back, he was made to carry that huge rugged cross. And he collapsed under the weight of it. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to criticise him for that. But what I find stunning is that all these people who'd received their sight, who'd, who'd received healing, who'd been fed and blessed, they all scattered. Nobody came to his help and they, they had to compel a man to carry the cross of the Lord Jesus. They wedged onto his sensitive brow a crown of thorns. They plucked his beard. They spat at him. They did their worst against the Lord Jesus. And eventually, of course, they nailed him to a cross and they suspended him high, covered only with blood and spittle and dust. And he hung there and he carried our sin. As he went into his sufferings, he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He spoke to his father about the people round about who were crucifying him and he prayed that they would repent. He prayed that they'd receive forgiveness. And then at the very end, when he'd paid the penalty for our sin, he cried, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He dismissed his spirit. He gave himself over to death. In the midst of his sufferings, as he was carrying on himself the weight of the world's sin, he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Bible teaches very clearly there's one God. He's Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And the Father has been in relationship with the Son and the Son in relationship with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in relationship with the Father throughout the eons of eternity past. But in some way that we can never fathom the depth of, when Jesus was on the cross carrying sin on himself, somehow that relationship between the Father and the Son was severed. He was forsaken by God so that we might be forgiven and never forsaken by God. He was cut off from the Father that we might come to know the Father, not just in time, through life, but into eternity. Jesus died on the cross. And God spoke. Yes, Jesus spoke. There were seven sayings that we are recorded in the Gospels of the things that he said. But God spoke, not with an audible voice, but he spoke for the very last time in the temple. Now, let me explain. If you go way back to the early books of the Bible, you'll find that <coughs> excuse me, the people of Israel were moving from Egypt, where they'd been in slavery for almost 400 years, to what we call the promised land. It had been promised to Abraham, a forefather, centuries before. And now God was leading the Israelites from Egypt towards the promised land. Moses was leading them. God gave all sorts of instructions and commands, the Ten Commandments, for example, to Moses. But there were instructions concerning a place of worship. They called it a tabernacle. It was really a tent, a mobile place of worship. And, and there were detailed descriptions about this tabernacle. And Christians find it fascinating to study all the details and see how actually everything is symbolising the Lord Jesus Christ in centuries to come. Now, there was a big courtyard and in the courtyard was this big tent. And there were two main sections in the tent and they were divided by a huge heavy curtain. It was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide. So it's much higher than it was wide. And it was woven to the width of a man's hand. In fact, it was so heavy, if ever it was to be moved, and it was moved, about once a year, the Israelites were moved on by God towards the promised land. And there were 40 years in this wandering, so there were about 40 occasions when God moved them on. If ever the, 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 the curtain, the veil, was to be moved, a whole group of priests had to come together. It was such a heavy sort of barrier between the one main section of the place of worship and this second inner section. Now, eventually, of course, the Israelites settled in their nation and under King Solomon, a temple was built. Beautiful. It was covered with gold. Can you imagine the Mediterranean sun blazing down on that temple and the reflection? It would be spectacularly bright. It's a wonderful sight. But in a very similar way to that moving tent, that place of worship, the temple, yes, all right, set in Jerusalem, but nevertheless, it had two main sections. And once again, there was this huge, heavy curtain separating 
the holy place, the holy of holies, as it's called, from the more straightforward part of the, the place of worship. Well, Solomon's temple remained for centuries, but eventually Israel was invaded by the Babylonians and the whole of the temple was destroyed. It was razed to the ground. But 46 years before Jesus was born, King Herod had the temple rebuilt. And once again, there was this veil, this curtain, this heavy barrier between the ordinary sort of place and the Holy of Holies. Now, when Jesus was crucified, he was carrying on himself our sin. He was paying the penalty for the wrong that we are guilty of. He was dying the substitute saviour. He was dying as a sacrifice for our sin. He was dying so that that which would condemn us might be washed away, forgiven, cleansed, might be removed so that you and I could come to know God in a personal way. And God spoke for the very last time in that temple. And how did he speak? He spoke by the temple curtain being torn. And interestingly, Luke says it was torn. Matthew gives us a little bit more detail. It says it was torn from top to bottom. As I said, 60 feet high. It was torn from the top. God himself tore it open. And the Holy of Holies, the holy place was suddenly open. Now, the significance of this is once every year, the Israelites would gather on what was called the Day of Atonement. And just one high priest would go beyond that veil into this very holy place. In the place was what's called the Ark of the Covenant. Covering over it was the mercy seat. In the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments. And there was some manna and there was Aaron's rod that, that budded. It was all in this Ark of the Covenant. But here was this wooden Ark covered with gold. And the high priest would go beyond that curtain, beyond that veil, into this holy place. He did so and he carried some blood. Blood to sort of atone for, to, to sort of bring forgiveness for his own sin, and blood representing atonement for, forgiveness for, the sins of the nation. This was a very, very holy, high day for the Israelites, this day of atonement. And if I can just go on a little aside here, of course, the Day of Atonement is still kept today. They don't have the temple. They don't have the, the Holy of Holies. They don't have the Ark of the Covenant. But it's still a very, very special day in the Judaistic calendar. In fact, when the Six-Day War began in um, 1967, the enemy attacked the Israelites on the Day of Atonement because they thought that, you know, they'll be, they'll be unprepared for war. But that's a different little aside. But now... The high priest would go into this holy place with blood for himself and blood for uh, the, the, the sort of cleansing for all the nation. And there'd be a tremendous sense of expectation. You, you'd, you, you can imagine the silence of the people as the high priest went beyond that veil. But Jesus died and the veil was torn and suddenly the holy place was made open. Now, what's the significance of this for the people of those days and for the people of our day? Well, four things, and I really do believe this applies to each of us. Whatever our spiritual state, whatever our awareness of God and our knowledge of God, this is incredibly important. First of all, when that veil was torn, distance was done away with. In other words... The idea of God, this holy God, being cut off from us by this veil, it was representing the distance between the holy God and sinful us. Have you ever tried to pray and thought, I don't know that my prayers go beyond the ceiling. You know, how, how can I talk to God? How can I? And, and God is cut off from us because of our wrongdoing. Now, we're all guilty of wrong. I think I remember the first lie I ever told I was only a little boy, and I remember my mother saying to me, Roger, did you take some chocolate from the pantry? And I said, no. And then she asked my older brother, and he said, no. 
And the next day, she got my brother and me again and said, Roger, did you take some chocolate from the, from the pantry? I said, no. And she asked my older brother, he said, no. And the next day, she called us again. Jeffrey, with my older brother, did you take some chocolate? No. Roger, did you? And I burst into tears and said, well, yes, I did. I've always loved chocolate. Anyway, and uh, yes, I did. And she said, I know you did, Roger. I saw you take it. Mm, mothers. <laughs> but it, I think it was the first lie I ever told. But how many more lies have I told? How many wrong thoughts have I had? How many wrong words have I said? How many wrong deeds have I done? There is so much about me I wouldn't want you all to know. And we can laugh about my little childhood lying. But there are other things I would never dare say publicly. But aren't we all like that? Conscience makes cowards of us all, said Shakespeare. The Bible's even more blunt. There is none righteous, no, not one. And our sins have cut us off from God. Our sins have separated us from, from this holy God. That's why they needed the high priest to go beyond the, the, the veil with blood to atone for their sin. But now the curtain's torn. And the distance between God and humanity has been done away with. It is possible for you, whoever you are, however you've lived, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whatever you've been involved in, it's possible for you to come, as it were, in your heart and mind to the cross of Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, you died for my sin. Please, would you forgive me and remove the barrier between God and me? Forgive all the sin that keeps me at a distance from him. Distance has been done away with because Jesus has died. But then secondly, the need for a deputy has been done away with. You see, the Israelites all gathered and they watched as that high priest went beyond that, that veil, that curtain. And that high priest, yes, he had to have blood to cover his own sin, but he was taking blood on behalf of the whole nation. But do you know, because the, the veil has been torn, you and I do not need a deputy to represent us apart from the Lord Jesus, who has represented us as he died on the cross for us. I, I, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying it's ever wrong to go to somebody and say, will you pray for me about this? Could you, you know, I, 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 can we pray together about something? No, we need help in our prayers. But you, you can approach the holy God. And that, as Ian said, is the most wonderful truth. Whoever we are, we might have the simplest of minds. We, you know, we might be a sort of brain with a body attached. It doesn't matter. We are invited to come as we are to God. Ask him to wash us, to forgive us and to meet with us. We do not need a deputy. I don't need to go to a priest and confess to him. I, d I don't need to find somebody who's holier than me and say, could you just put in a good word for me? No, I, you, we can all come to this holy God because Jesus has died and made a way whereby we can enter, well, boldly into the very presence of God. Thirdly, that veil being torn represents the fact that the emphasis on days has been done away with. You see, for the Israelites, it was that one day every year, the Day of Atonement, and they would wait for that day to come, and then the priest would go and represent them. But the emphasis on days has been done away with. Now, again, don't misunderstand me. It's a great thing on Good Friday or Easter Sunday or each Sunday to gather together and to worship God. But do you know you can come into God's presence, as it were, any time, any day, any moment, you can speak with him walking down the street. You can speak to him while you're busy in your work and you, you know, you can just praise God. You can ask God for your help. Now, I love to set aside a time each morning when I read my Bible and I pray and I commit the day to God. And then there'll be other times during the day where I perhaps meet with other Christians and I pray. But you can speak to him anytime, anywhere. The emphasis on a particular day when you can come and worship and have access to God has been done away with. 24-7, you can meet with this living God. One other thing, the dread of death has been done away with. You see, when the Israelites gathered and they watched this high priest go to the other side of the veil, and you can almost imagine his heart pounding, can't you? It was just once in a lifetime he'd ever go into this holy place and he'd, as it were, have a meeting with Almighty God. Just once. That was his 
you know, the pinnacle of his career. But there was always a fear. What if he'd gone into this holy place and he dropped dead? Now, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but Jewish writers have written this, and I could well believe it's true, that apparently this fear of death, this dread of death, led the high priest to tie a rope round his middle, and when he went beyond the veil, the rope would be under the veil so that if he dropped dead, they could pull him out without them having to go and rescue him. And his garments were such that he had around the hem of his garment a beautiful little pomegranate and a little bell, a beautiful pomegranate and a bell. So every movement, they'd be listening to the tinkling of the bell. And if it suddenly stopped, they could drag him out. But you know, we, if we are Christians, we do not need to fear death. Now, I don't want to die painfully. I've got to be honest as well. I don't want to die suddenly. I'd like a little warning so I can apologise to everybody and just say my goodbyes. But nevertheless, okay, you know, one, one has some apprehension about dying. But I'm not apprehensive about what will happen when I die. When this heart of mine stops beating, when somebody pronounces me dead... They may not realise it, but do you know, I may be absent from the body, I will be present with the Lord. That's absolutely promised, because the only thing that would condemn me to hell is my sin. But my sin has been dealt with by Jesus 2,000 years ago on the cross. And more than that, he has given to me all his goodness, his righteousness. My sin was laid on him when I trusted Jesus his goodness was credited to me. It's a great exchange. He took my guilt. He's given to me his obedience. What a wonderful thing. I remember I was speaking at a series of, well, a week-long events in Liverpool University. And uh, my wife phoned me up. I, I, I forgot, an early evening or something. And she said, Roger, your Uncle Ken is dying. And I think, from what I understand, if you're going to see him one last time, you need to get back to Wakefield to a hospice and uh, go and see him there. And I said, well, I can't do it now. I'll speak at this meeting and afterwards I'll make a quick dash across the Pennines and I'll go and see him. And I arrived in the hospice at about half past 11 at night and he was in his own room, of course, and there was his, his wife. He was quite aged, but there was his wife there and... Um, I sat, I spoke to her, but he was unconscious. And uh, I was there, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes or so. And I've got to be honest, I was concerned for my uncle and, um, and my aunt. They didn't have any children. But whenever I was in the area where they lived, in the Wakefield area, if ever I was preaching there, they always used to come and hear me. And time and again, I used to pray a prayer of commitment and faith, a bit like we do each night here. <clears throat> and, and, and I longed to see them respond to Jesus Christ. But as far as I knew, he never did. And there he was. He was unconscious. I was visiting and it was going to be for the very last time. And eventually, I needed to get back to Liverpool for an eight o'clock in the morning meeting the next day. And I, I said to my aunt, I need to go now. And... Um, I think I gave her a hug and I said, let's just have one final prayer, shall we? And I held my uncle's hand, still unconscious, and I prayed. I don't remember what I prayed, but I'm sure I prayed for him and for my aunt. And I let go of the hand and at that moment, what a moment, he just sort of gently sat up and he opened his eyes and he just said, Roger, I want you to know I have trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. And when I die, I'm going to be with him. He closed his eyes. He never said another word. He died about 36 hours later on. What comfort, what joy for me and for him. No dread of death. Yes, his body had lost all its strength. And he was about to pass from this world to the next. But... Because he trusted Jesus Christ, he was going home. When Jesus died on the cross, our sins were laid on him. And God spoke in the temple by tearing it from top to bottom. And his holy presence was open to all. We do not need to fear death. If Jesus Christ has died for us, he's taken away the sting of death, which is sin. And he'll be with us through life's journey. And he will be with us when we pass from this world to the next. And then he'll take us to be with himself. 
the veil has been torn from top to bottom because Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. And what Ian said at the end is absolutely right. That is more important than any scientific eureka moment. Not that one's minimizing those, but the greatest thing is to know peace with God through all that Jesus accomplished by his death. And of course, he was buried and rose from the dead. And did you notice that Ian used that word repent? It, it, it's an old word. And yet Jesus said, we must repent. In fact, in the book of Acts, we read that God commands us to repent. It means to turn from our own ways and turn to trust the Lord Jesus. Have you ever done that? We've come to the end of five great evenings. But to me, I, I suppose my heart would ache if I felt, oh, you were going out tonight and you've still not yet trusted in the Lord Jesus, repented and believed. I really would encourage, I, I would urge you to do so. The Bible says this, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It said whoever believes in the Lord Jesus shall be saved. It said whoever receives him will become the children of God. And if you haven't yet called on the name of the Lord or believed or received him into your life, would you be willing to do so tonight? Would you be willing just to settle this eternal issue and say, Lord Jesus, I want you please to forgive me and to become my Lord and Saviour. Would you pray like that? Would you say, God, with, with your strength, I want to start going the way that you would have me go in whatever area, whatever sphere of influence that is, I want to live for you and I want to enjoy you and make you known. We're going to pray a prayer similar to the one that we've prayed night by night and I would beg you with all my heart, I would beg you, Pray this prayer with me. Make Good Friday 2015 the greatest day in your life when you get right with God. It will change not only your life, but your eternity. It really will. Ask him to become your Lord and Saviour. And then begin that adventure of going on with him and growing in your Christian faith and maturity and enjoying him. The Christian life isn't easy. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's not easy, but God gives the strength and he changes your desires and gives you the power to start living as you should. He really does. And then he begins to mould you and make you into the man, the woman he created you to be. So perhaps this is your moment, the moment you were born for, I encourage you, I, I urge you to pray this prayer with me, not out loud, but in your heart and mind to personalise it and make it your own. And then afterwards, when we're given a moment just to fill in that card, just write down something like, I prayed that prayer tonight. I'll be at the front and uh, Sarah will be there as well and we'll have a little booklet that has the prayer in it and some tips about how you can grow as a Christian. By all means, please come and talk to Sarah or me and just say, I need one of those booklets or I prayed the prayer. But write it down on that card as well and... Just note this day as, right, from this day onwards, with God's help, I'm going his way and I'm trusting him. I'm going beyond the veil into the very presence of God, not just for time, but for all eternity. Let's pray. I'm going to read this prayer. It's on the screen. I'm going to read it and pray it slowly so you've got the opportunity to personalise it and make it your own. Not out loud, but in your heart and mind. Will you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you know all that there is to know about me. But I want to say I'm sorry for all my sin. And I want to turn from it. I do believe that Jesus died for me. And that he rose from the dead. Please forgive me. Come and live in my life and become my Lord and Saviour and help me to follow you. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, please do come and talk. I'll be at the front. Professor White at the back.